Turn your Bibles to John chapter 7, verses 1 through 8 is what we will be reading today. The Bible says, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret, while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not going up to this feast. Excuse me, I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. You may not realize the command in what Jesus says here, but he tells his brothers, you go up to the feast. That's a command. So the command of Christ we're studying today is go to the feast. Now let me just say this, this has nothing to do with dinner Sunday. As much as I like dinner Sundays and like to have them reg regularly scheduled on the calendar of the church, don't think you're going to hear anything about dinner Sundays. But what we do encounter here in this passage is a strange but very important fact. The natural brothers of Jesus did not believe in him. Now, one would think that these young men, raised in the same household with Jesus, and who undoubtedly worked alongside him uh, in Joseph's uh, carpenter shop, would have had some kind of inkling as to his somewhat unusual nature and mission. Instead of being a carpenter, Big Brother decided to go off and be a preacher. Not a rabbi in a particular synagogue, but of all things an itinerant preacher with a ragtag gang of misfits following him. That was their Big Brother. They may have thought him fanatical, or perhaps a little touched in the head, especially since his preaching offended the Jewish leaders who were now looking for an opportunity to kill him. The time came to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, and these brothers show their unbelief by ridiculing Jesus. They're saying, in essence, since you want everyone to know who you are, Go up to this feast with your silly disciples. Jesus gives what appears to be a very curt response to their ridicule, but it serves to put them in their place. While this event revealed the unbelief of his natural brothers, it also reflects on the potential for unbelief on the part of Jesus' spiritual brothers the church. It has been said that familiarity breeds contempt. It may not seem rational to say that belief breeds unbelief, but in the Christian experience there is a tendency to take things of God for granted. You see, when we were first saved, we loved reading the Bible. We loved going to churches, services, and we even loved going to prayer meetings. But after reading the Bible for the tenth time, we know what the next verse is going to say before we read it. After listening to a thousand sermons, we reasonably know what the preacher is going to say next Sunday. And prayer meetings become routine and ritualistic. And we put our brains in neutral and just keep praying over the same names on the list year after year. What has happened is we have been steeped in matters of belief for so long 
that we slip into a pattern of taking things for granted, that it actually becomes a form of unbelief. An example can be found in Acts chapter 12, verse 5, where it records this. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that what the church is supposed to do? Notice it was not just prayer, but it was constant prayer. Uh, Herod Agrippa was about to have Peter executed, and the church went to prayer for Peter. And I think this constant prayer was round the clock, round the clock, 24 hours a day, a group of people here, a group of people there, a group of people in another place were praying for Peter and God's deliverance. And I believe that the church really believed, I mean really believed, that God could release Peter from the prison. And God did release him. And Peter found his way to the prayer meeting. And what we encounter is unbelief in the middle of belief. Peter knocked on the door, and a teenage girl named Rhoda came and discovered it was Peter knocking. However, instead of opening the door and letting him in, she ran back into the house and told everyone, hey, Peter's out front. Well, what was their response? Verses 15 and 16 says this, but they said to her, you were beside yourself. Rhoda, you're crazy. You're upset. You don't know what you're talking about. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. You see, the Jews had a belief that every person had a guardian angel. And they were thinking, okay, well, it's his guardian angel. That seems strange to me to think that because why wasn't his guardian angel at the prison guarding Peter? Why was he there knocking on the door? It just doesn't make sense. Well, <laughs> now Peter continued knocking. Eventually they did come to the door. Listen to what it says here. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were astonished. They weren't expecting to see Peter there. They had been praying for Peter for days, continually praying for Peter. They believed with all their hearts that God could deliver him out of the prison. But when they opened the door and there stood Peter, they were astonished. Here we find unbelief in the middle of belief. They believed God could release Peter, but they did not believe God would release him. There's a difference in believing what God can do and what God will do. A very honest man expressed this so eloquently in Mark chapter 9, verse 24. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Every time I read that, just my heart aches. Not just for this man, this event is long over in history. The, Jesus did heal the boy, did answer the man's prayer. But just that cry, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And I just wonder, in the absence of what we would like to see, the moving of God in our community, do we break down and cry out, God, help, I believe, but help my unbelief? I think there is a tremendous lack of faith. There's a lot of believing in the church, but a not very much expecting in the church. 
This man brought his son to Jesus, believing that Jesus could heal him. He had heard reports. Jesus can do this. His problem was in believing that Jesus would heal him. That was his battle with unbelief. He believed Jesus could, but he was not sure Jesus would. There can be a time for us when the things of God become so commonplace, and we know everything God can do, that we forget to believe in what God will do. It is at that time that Jesus tells us to go to the feast. His brothers responded to him out of their unbelief. And his command to them was, go up to the feast. And when we find ourselves muddled down with unbelief in the midst of our belief, Jesus is going to command us whether individually or as congregations, go up to the feast. So Jesus, we see, told his brothers to go up to the feast without him. The reason he gave was that his time had not fully come. As Christians, we do like the security of the commonplace, and we really do not realize this complacency has infiltrated our ability to believe what Jesus really will do. He will tell us to go ahead of him, apparently to work on our own. Mm -hmm. And this can be something in our personal experience. Jesus tells you, okay, you're at this place, you go on ahead. I'll catch up with you later. Or perhaps as the congregation he says, okay, you all go on ahead. Go ahead. I'll catch up when I'm ready. We have been so conditioned to follow Jesus. How many commands have we already studied, studied where Jesus commanded us to follow him? There have been quite a few, hasn't it? But when he tells us to go ahead of him, we feel uncomfortable. We're so used to following Jesus. We don't even want to think about going on ahead of Him. But yet, there are times when that is exactly what He commands us to do. And He knows that we feel uncomfortable in going ahead of Him. And the reason He pushes us out of our comfort zones is to show us how much we have really given in to unbelief. It is, as, it is as if he says to us, Oh yes, I know you believe what I can do. Now let's see if you believe what I will do. That's the whole point of him pushing us out ahead. Just believe what I will do. I think it's a true statement that we do not like naked faith. We like our faith to be dressed in nice church clothes, respectable, conservative. Mm -hmm. We are afraid of being exposed and looking silly if he presses us into naked faith. I really think that's what's at the root of this. There's some personal pride. You know, we like to think of ourselves as people of faith. But to be pushed out front, to have to act in naked faith, makes us feel uncomfortable. The truth in the kingdom of God is that most of the great miracles have come out of naked faith, where saints of God break down and claim by faith alone what God will do. It is at times like these we feel very much alone. 
You see, Jesus remained in Galilee while his brothers went on up to Jerusalem to participate in the faith, uh, in the feast. But notice in the 10th verse of chapter 7 of John, but when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as if it were in secret. From this we learn that while we are feeling so very much alone and exposed while we are out ahead of Jesus, Jesus really is following right behind. We don't see him because we're looking ahead. But all the time, he's right behind us. You see, Jesus went to the feast in secret, which tells us he is really with us, but incognito, in disguise, if you please, in a way that we don't recognize. And furthermore, while we do not recognize it, he is actually helping with our faith and supporting our faith, enabling us to do his will. Does that give you a different perspective when Jesus pushes you up front? He's really there right behind you. And you're having to act in faith, not in what he can do, but what he will do. And all the time he is there supporting that faith and encouraging that faith and enabling you to do the will of God. So you don't do the will of God on your own. You do the will of God with the help of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The faith lesson Jesus wants us to learn is that our faith is actually a passive faith, which must be energized by Christ's faith. Our faith usually is not proactive. Our faith usually waits for results before we believe. And that's a form of unbelief. The Apostle Paul tried to explain this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, where he writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. <clears throat> You may not realize it, but in this translation, the New King James, there's a contradiction here. And other modern versions follow this contradiction. Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but what? Christ who lives in me. Then he turns around and says, the life that I live, I live by faith in Jesus. Okay? The literal translation of what Paul wrote is this. In faith I live, that of the Son of God. Now that makes no sense to us in English. Mm -hmm. um, Young's literal translation has it cor correctly translated, but it is just as un-English as the Greek. Young translated, in the faith I live of the Son of God. That is very correct. But try to explain that. Try to get your brain wrapped around that. In English, it does not make sense to us. The best rendition is the King James Version. It says, in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God. That captures the real meaning of what Paul was writing there. The American Standard Version tried to expand on this, attempting to do a little bit better, and it has, in the flesh I live in faith, the faith which is in the Son of God. But modern speakers of English would tend to think of their personal faith in Christ, not Christ's faith residing in them. You've got to shift the focus from your faith in Him 
to his faith that he carries as he lives in you. It is the faith of Jesus Christ. What Paul wrote in Galatians 2.20 was very close to what the man said in Mark 9.24, I believe. Please help my unbelief. For our faith to be effective, it must be indwelt by Christ's personal faith, not our faith in Him. Friends, this is a miracle. And it can only be realized by going ahead of Christ to the feast, just as He said. You gain faith by doing. You gain belief by experiencing. And Jesus knows this. And He has to, from time to time, push us ahead of ourselves. You go on up to the faith. Uh, excuse me, the feast. And we feel very much alone. We feel very much exposed. But let me assure you, that however exposed you may feel, the Lord Jesus Christ is right behind you, incognito. You don't see Him. But He is giving His faith to you. And that faith of Christ energizes your faith. So you don't only believe what He can do, but what He will do. The Apostle John wrote concerning prayer, which is the foundation of all the work of God, all the work of the church, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And we know that when He hears us, we have the things that we ask of Him. It is not sufficient to believe what God can do. You see, even the devil knows what God can do. So if, as Christians, if as a congregation, we just pray and believe in what God can do, we aren't any better off than the devil. Now, that may offend some people hearing this, but stop and think about it. We must know what God will do. This suggests to me that before we ask God in prayer to do anything, we must first ask God what is His will on the thing for which we are to pray. I notice in prayer meetings, not here, just here, but everywhere. You know, we say, well, you know, prayer requests. And, you know, there'll be a half dozen, dozen prayer requests. And we immediately get down on our knees and we pray, God bless this person, God move here, God do this, God do the other thing. And we forget what John tells us. Before we pray, God, please heal brother so-and-so, or God, move on this person. We need to get down, Lord, what is your will concerning this disease, this situation? We tend to skip that part. And we end up as Christians praying what we believe God can do. But we don't really form a faith in what God will do. If God is going to take Brother Saint on to heaven with cancer, listen to this. We will be out of order to ask God to heal him of cancer. It's useless to pray for God to heal Brother Saint. God's going to take him. Well, it's only stage two cancer. You know, we need to pray God will heal him of that. No, you don't. There's another direction to pray. If you know that is the will of God, what God will do. So as we pray for Brother Saint, we need to say, God, what is your will concerning Brother Saint and this cancer? 
And God may say, okay, I, I, I want to heal this brother. Then we better get down and pray that God will heal him. Because that's what God wants to do, what God will do. And if we know what God wants to do, what God will do, we better pray in that direction. But you know, if we get down and we pray and say, God, what is your will concerning this? And God tells us, I'm going to take him with cancer. It changes how we need to pray for brother's sake. Lord, help him through this. Help his family through this situation. Well, keep him as comfortable and, uh, as possible. You know, I mean, there's different ways to pray about that if you know God's going to take him. When praying for the lost, we know that it is God's will to save them. But they're actually being saved as a matter of a choice they must make in response to God calling them. So when we pray for the lost, we need to ask God if that person is actually being called by God. Otherwise, we must leave that person in the hands of God until such a time as God does call him. It's no use praying for somebody that God's not dealing with. You're frustrating yourself. You pray yourself into that complacency I mentioned earlier. You believe that God can save this sinner, but you're not really believing God will save him. But I tell you, when God begins to show us that he is dealing with this man, this woman, this boy, this girl. Then it's really time to get hold of the feet of Jesus and to pray, Lord, bring conviction, rebuke the powers of hell that would drive this person away, confuse this person, distract this person. Pray for them because we know God is dealing with that person. So there is something about the faith of Christ working in and through us. It accomplishes the will of God. Are we seeing the will of God accomplished in our own lives? Are we seeing the will of God accomplished? In the work of this congregation, the work of your congregation, are you seeing the will of God being accomplished? Or are we simply content to believe in the commonplace? What God can do without believing what God will do. Amen.